and I lost it. The Smiths slipped through factory's gates and signed with a London independent label, Rough Trade. But Wilson's partner, Rob Gretton, didn't want them anyway. Because your demos are fucking shit. This is a band who he was wandering around Manchester going to everybody, the Smiths are the new Beatles, but your demos are shit. Do a new demo and then we'll sign you. So I think Morrissey thought, fuck off. Because he'd done Joy Division in a way, because he'd done what he'd done, sensibilities like Morrissey would not want to go with Tony Wilson. You know, it would, be, it would just be wrong. Their versions of the city are so separate, they're so distinct, they're so different, that they could just never work together. By now, there was a serious descent on the factory floor. In-house producer Martin Hannett thought the company should build its own recording studio, but no one agreed with him. He later sued Factory for unpaid royalties. The company gave his lawsuit its own catalogue number, FAC 61. Hannett's commitment to Factory was to make great records. It's all very well having your fun and giving catalogue numbers to stationery and, and, and... But what you really need to back all that up is great records. Uh, and, and to an extent, that was Hannett's job. As far as I was concerned, it just had a lot to do with my budgets, you know, which suddenly vanished down a hole in the ground called Hacienda. He felt, quite rightly, that Factory should open their own studio because they're a record company, and if they opened their own studio within one album, you'd have paid for the studio. And he was absolutely 100% right. But... We didn't open a studio, we opened a nightclub. Bernard Sumner took over producing some of Factory's records, including a New Order single that transformed both the group's popularity and Factory's fading image overnight. But not their respective bank accounts. Blue Monday, the biggest selling 12-inch record of all time, 12-inch single of all time, lost every lost money on every single copy because the sleeve was so expensive to manufacture, it lost money. Peter Savile's sleeve for Blue Monday was constructed like a computer floppy disk, one programmed for self-destruct. Unpre unprecedented sales and this astonishingly expensive sleeve. He had a fantastic big hit single that was losing the money every the more successful it became. But I love that, I mean, that's fantastic. The single climbed the charts, losing money on every sale. Inevitably, Top of the Pops came calling. New Order agreed to appear, but only if they could perform live in the studio. Something that had never been done before. The other funny thing was that the record went down, because <laughs> it sounded so terrible on TV. <laughs> it was classic. How does it feel when you treat me like you do? Our record went down every single time we appeared on Top of the Pops, whereas everybody else's record always went up, because we sounded so bad. I thought I was mistaken, and I thought I'd heard you speak. Tell me how do I feel? Tell me now, how do I feel? I think we actually kept very much to our punk ethics right the way through New Order, you know, our attitude was very punky and factories was as well which was what was you know great about it i remember bono coming over to rob rob and i was stood there at the end and bono came over and went i really really respect you for doing that i, I really you know wish we would have done that and rob, so rob just turned around pushed his glass and we went why the fuck didn't you then pickering managed live acts at the hacienda and had an uncanny nose for talent booking many of the biggest bands of the early 80s way before they became famous. One or two came back and, you know, rewarded our loyalty to them, but not many. Funny that, isn't it? <laughs> In 1985, Pickering staged a stiff Chiswick-style battle of the bands. 
Competing that night was a little-known local group that would give the factory experiment new purpose and meaning. They called themselves Happy Mondays. You had one band that was just like culture club, another band that was like Air Cut 100, another band that was like Madness, and then us. And, you know, we was pretty shit. But, you know, we couldn't really play. And, of course, when the votes came in, we was last. And when Tony announced it, we'd won it. So that was a great thing about Tony. It's like, fuck what they voted. Is that true? They, you were last? Yeah, absolutely true, yeah. The truth. It was rigged? Of course it was rigged. I think about 10 or 15 junkies turned up to watch us. All because they could get in and black beer and rob the handbags off the students. House music from Detroit and Chicago found one of its first homes in Britain at the Hacienda. In 1984, DJ Mike Pickering created Nude Night at the club and ushered in the age of the rave. We made it cheap to get in. The door policy was there was no door policy. Everyone could get in. Within like three weeks, we had 1,600 people in a 1,200 capacity place. The Happy Mondays were a 24-hour party band, a perfect fit for the new scene, but not for a serious, arty label like Factory. No one seemed brave enough to take them on. We get A&R people coming down from London Records and other record companies speak to us, and we, you know, and they go like. OK, but the band's got no image. We need an image for the band, you know. They, they're just like, they're just wearing trainers and jeans and hats and T-shirts and anoraks, and there's no image. OK, what do you want us to be like then? Uh, well, some hair, some winkle pickers, some tight kecks, some makeup. All right, OK, like everyone else, right, all right. The Mondays lacked Factory's trademark angst and pretension, but Pickering suggested that the label should sign them anyway. Wilson agreed. He now had a genuinely street-smart, unruly gang with guitars to help realise his vision. In the North, we'd play like working men's clubs, but not on a working men's clubs night. It'd be like the son who'd gone to university. You know, I'm putting a night on tonight, you know, and just be simply because we were on factory, we got the gig. And normally, as soon as they seen us, they would have dismissed us, but one because on factory, they're like, well, we'll see. You know, there must be something about him because Tony's, you know, signed him. It was so non typical factory, you know, it wasn't what, what, what it, it was assumed factory did, and it was finally a sudden burst of, of non factory life, you know, that, that, that seemed to fit with the times and then gave the Hacienda its own sense that factory did know what they were doing. Because, of course, the Hacienda wouldn't have made as much sense if they hadn't had the Happy Mondays, you know, it, it kind of worked together, the two things worked together. Wilson championed Happy Mondays as the people's band, with the help of a promotions budget unprecedented at factory. Now managed by one of his close friends, Nathan McGough, the band was beginning to enjoy both critical and financial. We now remember the Stone Roses, quite rightly, for things like 